The news at six starts right now. Good evening and thanks for being with us on this Friday. I'm Raj Mathai. And I'm Jessica Aguirre in the NBC Barry Studios. Also with us tonight is Janelle Wang working from home. Yeah, Jessica, I spoke to a doctor today about a new test to test a certain group of patients, the ones that show few symptoms. This test could be the key to help treating the sickest patients. So I'm going to tell you about that in a few minutes, but first I'm going to send it back to you guys in the studio. Okay, Janelle, we'll see you shortly. Here's what's happening right now. You might have gotten this alert. Santa Clara County reminding people to stay at home. Health officials say the virus is probably more prevalent than we think. It's likely it's been in Santa Clara County since December. 20 people now in that county have died from COVID-19. It's really not important if you want to stay healthy to be counting numbers and trying to look at curves. What's really, really important is to stay at home, stay away from other people as much as you can, do the social distancing. That is good guidance. Also today, Governor Newsom taking action to protect renters. He put a ban on evictions through May. And you see the governor there down in Los Angeles to welcome the Navy hospital ship named Mercy. It's now docked, ready to help those overwhelmed hospitals. As for the latest numbers, the total number of cases statewide, more than 3,800, which is up about 25% from yesterday. Well, tonight in the Bay Area, there are more than 1,600 cases in the last 30 minutes. Marin County announced its first death. The patient, a man in his 70s who's been hospitalized for three weeks after being exposed on the Grand Princess. Santa Clara County, though, continues to see the most cases with 574. The surge of infections is expected to arrive next week. And as we first reported last week, the Santa Clara Convention Center is being Beds. We need the space to handle all those patients. Today, NBC Barry's Damien Trujillo was a TV pool reporter allowed inside. Damien joins us from San Jose. And Damien, this is going to be for the people who have been exposed and but that are not really that sick, don't have to be in a hospital. That is correct. They are, they are uh, positive for a coronavirus, and so they are there uh, at the Santa Clara Convention Center, or they will be there. It, it was fascinating and eerie at the same time. We're talking about 250 beds inside the convention center as the county braces itself for next week. Every second counts as federal, state, and local workers rush to get the Santa Clara Convention Center ready for COVID-19 patients. We'll be separating males and females, adults only. Dr. Jennifer Tong is spearheading the county's hospital surge plans. Today, the 146 airlift unit of the National Guard will spend 12 hours setting up this makeshift hospital. In between the major rows here, we would have nursing stations um, where charting can occur, where they'll have um, various uh, medical supplies that they might need to provide care to the individuals here. The hospital will be for patients who are COVID positive and need to stay quarantined, but are well enough to leave the hospital, specifically people that might not have a safe, effective place to isolate for the rest of their ordered quarantine. So this is a low acuity medical setting. We would not have um, ventilated patients here. Uh, there are a set of medical supplies that come along with this federal medical station. Um, it does include things like IVs in the event that a patient needs that, but we would not expect uh, most patients here to need that level of acuity. The goal is to free up hospital beds for the sickest patients. Volunteer doctors and nurses from across the state will run this hospital. The patients here don't have to practice social distancing since they will all be COVID positive. We expect that patients might be here for um, as many as two, sometimes three weeks before they are um, uh, safe to again be around others. And that National Guard unit is based out of Channel Islands. Uh, the leaders here in the county say the trajectory of the, of the uh, uh, coronavirus is not dictated by the virus itself. It's people who refuse to isolate. They're the ones who are spiking up that curve. We're live in the South Bay. I'm Damian Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. Damian, thank you. San Mateo County just making a major announcement and a major change that impacts people from many other counties as well. As of 6 p.m., so four minutes ago, all county parks, which includes many of the beaches, are closed. It's part of a Bay Area-wide push to keep crowds from gathering like what we saw happen last weekend. In San Francisco, similar measures. Parking lots at several beaches and open space areas are closed and barricaded. That includes parking lots for the Marina Green, Ocean Beach, and Chrissy Field. Now, the mayor says they don't want to 
get to the point where they're closing the actual parks, but they will do that if needed. We uh, are pushing folks to really try and stay, uh, get your fresh air, walk your dogs, uh, but don't get in your cars and drive to specific locations uh, to play volleyball with your friends, to have picnics, to have wine parties. Yeah, if you want to get fresh air, do so, but maintain social distance. Like she said, no basketball, uh, tennis matches in public courts uh, or group picnics. Well, Governor Newsom are impacted by COVID-19. Evicting tenants for not paying rent, but because of the whole current crisis, it also blocks them from enforcing any eviction order until at least the end of May. NBC Barry's Lily Tan talked to some tenants and the attorneys who say the order really doesn't go far enough. And Lily, uh, some cities had already done this before the governor did it. Yeah, that's right. And tenants were really hoping for more time to pay rent. But as attorneys tell us, the governor's order extends the amount of time for the legal process, but not the time tenants have to pay rent. Today, a little relief for renters caught in the COVID-19 crisis, with Governor Gavin Newsom issuing a statewide order banning evictions for renters. So for tenants through May 31st, uh, there will be no eviction proceedings. There'll be no enforcement as it relates to your inability to pay for COVID-19. Good news for some, but for Carly Angel, a resident at Brookdale Senior Living in San Pablo, she was hoping for more room to breathe. In my case, lung problems where I have to use oxygen at night, and my doctor absolutely does not want me to move to a new community. Today was the last day the 73-year-old and other residents were supposed to stay after management sent them eviction notices in January. The public health crisis delayed the evictions, but ultimately won't change things. This order only pertains to evictions for non payment of rent. Tenant rights attorney Jackie Zaneri says if tenants like Carly received an eviction notice for a reason other than non-payment of rent, the governor's order will not help them or anyone. But what he did now is not going to protect any tenants. She says the governor's order will extend the time for the legal process, but won't give renters, even ones impacted by COVID-19, any more time to pay rent. Now, the fear, attorneys say, is tenants may think it's a moratorium on all types of evictions when it's not, and renters should look towards their city ordinances for more help. We're live in San Francisco, Lili Tan, NBC Bay Area News. Okay, thank you, Lili. Let's talk about something that's really tough and stressful right now. A lot of people, grocery shopping has become a challenge, a chore. Now some stores are trying to ease some of that anxiety about if you can find what you need and how you can avoid the crowds. The owners of the grocery store outlet in Pleasant Hill is going on Facebook Live twice a day. He gives his shoppers a behind the shelves look at what's in stock, what they don't have. Jason Olson also is urging people to call the local grocery store and ask when the crowds are lighter. And the biggest message I have is don't panic, right? We've got product and that's what keeps me pumped up and motivated because I feel like hey, I am giving back to my community and we're all going to get through this. Some other advice, be sure to wipe down your shopping cart basket before you use it, especially the handle. Most grocery stores have those wipes available there. If you see a crowded aisle, skip it. Wait for the people to leave, move to another one. That makes sense. And if you can assign one person in the family, have that person be the one in charge of doing all the grocery shopping. We've reported on the nasal swab test. There's now a second test in the works for certain patients. Let's bring in Janelle Wang, who's working from home and joins us now with this new information. Janelle. Yeah, Raj, this test is for patients who really aren't showing any symptoms, but they have the virus, which means they have the antibody to help fight the virus. I found out more from Dr. John Torres, an ER doctor and NBC News medical correspondent. This is spreading throughout the country, and so there's a lot of people that are what we call asymptomatic, and what they're describing it is almost like an iceberg, that the people we're seeing right now in the hospitals are the tip of the iceberg. Underneath the water is that two-thirds of people who probably don't know they have it because their symptoms are either so mild or they have no symptoms at all, so they don't know they have the disease, but they could be building up antibodies, and that's why they're developing a second test, not the nasal swab you keep seeing nowadays, but it's an antibody test. It's a little pinprick to get some blood, and they'll put that on there, and they should be able to tell within a few minutes whether you have had it over the past few weeks. And if you have, then more than likely you have some immunity to it now and your blood can help other patients out. 
Dr. Torres says this test will come out in the next few weeks or few months and will paint a more accurate picture of where the more cases are and then where we can move resources to get this virus under control. So he had a lot of helpful information. I'll have more with him coming up tonight at 7. Super interesting. Good information. Thank you, Janelle. We'll see you shortly. Up next here at 6, looking for ways to treat and prevent coronavirus, but the government is getting in the way. That's what we're being told. We investigate a group of UC Berkeley researchers trying to cut through this red tape. They bring music to students in Contra Costa County, but with school, their songs have gone silent. The support a couple is now getting during some tough times. I'm Chief Meteorologist Jeff Ranieri. I'll have the latest details on some rain rolling in this weekend. That's in about eight minutes. Bay Area labs are working overtime to find a cure or even a treatment for COVID-19, but some local scientists tell us they're waiting on federal funding, a process that's way too slow for this current crisis. Your senior investigative reporter, Stephen Stock. This research lab at UC Berkeley has the tools and the talent to help find a cure for COVID-19. Very nice, very nice. Biochemist Julia Shaletsky so directs a team of scientists at Berkeley's Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. As she and her colleague Eddie Wary prepare to fight this pandemic, they're missing one essential ingredient, money to pay for staffing, chemical compounds, and biosafety gear. If I had the funding right now, I would start probably in the next couple of weeks already four different projects we have in the works. Dr. Shaletsky says a key to stopping the spread of this virus is understanding exactly how it attaches to a human cell. Protein spikes on the virus dock on the human cell, working like a biological key. 
Her team is ready to search for a way to block the virus if they are given the resources to do it. You can interrupt that if you just make sure that the key doesn't fit the lock. And that's what we could be doing with small molecules and blocking that part. For example, this robotic lab assistant can quickly and accurately test tens of thousands of potential drugs to see which one might prove effective at stopping COVID-19. Dr. Shalatsky cites another battlefront for research, controlling a patient's immune response to the virus. Scientists have discovered that some seriously ill patients actually have few virus cells left in their bodies. Shalatsky says doctors can save lives by learning how to switch off parts of the human immune system. And sometimes we need the immune system to react to clear the virus, but some of it is always an, also an overreaction. So the immune system goes crazy and destroys all your lung tissue, for example. Most scientists want to make a difference and want to try to contribute to a solution. ASAP, really, everybody's chomping at the bit to make this happen. But their eagerness to solve these puzzles remains hampered by a federal funding process which can take months while the spread of the pandemic won't wait. We have to go through accelerated review which still can take up to 60 days which is just, just too long. Every day is of the essence right now um, in order to develop something. The National Science Foundation has already approved 20 different research projects focused on COVID-19, including 10 rapid response grants worth more than $1.5 million. But they admit there are 40 other research proposals focused on stopping COVID-19, still waiting on approval and funding. I'm Stephen Stock, NBC Bay Area News. Stephen, thank you. And within the last 90 minutes, a major development about testing. It's a new way of doing it. It gives you results in about five minutes. It's being developed in the Bay Area. Abbott Labs, a pharmaceutical company with offices in the South Bay, just got emergency authorization from the FDA for rapid results tests to detect COVID-19. This is video provided to us from Abbott. The test is portable, done on about a six pound platform that's the size of a toaster. It generates a, an accurate test result in a matter of minutes instead of hours or days. Uh, and that enables the healthcare provider to see a patient, diagnose a patient, and take the necessary interventions in a very short amount of time. Again, a six pound unit, portable, you get the results in about five minutes. Abbott tells us with this FDA approval, the emergency approval, it will ramp up its production and hopes to eventually produce up to five million tests per month. While keeping the music playing by rewriting the playbook, an East Bay couple that provides music education to thousands of kids across the Bay Area is now scrambling to find a way to keep their program going. NBC Bay Area's Jody Hernandez gives us a peek. For 20 years, we've been playing music from Mexico, the music that we love. Arwen Lawrence and Jorge Lisiaga have made it their mission to share their love of Latin music. Mira ya va, Mira ya va, de flor en flor. De flor. The duo, called Cascada de Flores, has been bringing their musical passion and programs into schools and libraries across the Bay Area for years in hopes of keeping a piece of Mexican tradition alive. It is important because they can, uh, they have to, don't lose their, the, the, the roots of the, the family, the, the music, or the, the, the probably the, the abuelo. To encourage the pride of being Latino, of being Mexicano, of being Chicano. But the COVID-19 crisis has changed everything. The 70 performances they had scheduled for this spring have all canceled. Half their yearly income wiped out. It feels like the carpet's been just, or the floor has been taken out from under us, and we want to work. <laughs> The couple is doing their best to reinvent themselves. They've been experimenting with delivering their classes online. The learning curve has been steep, but they're slowly connecting. We've heard that, oh, you just brought us so much joy. My child was has been so sad and was jumping around and so happy to see your faces. Cascada de Flores is hoping to attract sponsors to keep them afloat and their programs running. They say it's more important than ever to share the beauty of music. It's essential. Music is essential. Singing is essential. Dancing is essential. In Richmond, 
Jody Hernandez, NBC <laughs> Bay Area News. Now, how could you not feel better at home, isolating, listening to those two and dancing along with them? Uh, that would be it, phenomenal. It, it makes you feel good. Just yes. seeing, seeing a one-minute story on that makes you feel good. Let's bring in Jeff Ranieri on this Friday uh, with some forecasting for our Saturday and Sunday, Jeff. And I think we're going to get, uh, you know, some rainfall moving in. And I know it feels really nothing like a normal weekend, but maybe you're going to be able to give yourself a break from the homeschooling and also the work at home. You can put the laptop away, log off for a little bit. And that rain, who knows, might be able to calm you down uh, and just kind of make you feel a little bit better. As we get a live look outside right now, we are starting to see some changes outside of our live sky camera network. Most notably, the cloud cover moving in and wind picking up out ahead of our next storm system about 10 to 20 miles per hour. Currently in Concord, 56 degrees. By uh, 9 o'clock, we're down to 51. So if you have to head out to the store to get some essentials or maybe the pharmacy, uh, you'll need your jacket, but not the umbrella tonight. Now, one thing I do want to highlight this that could have been bugging you the past two days is the pollen. It still remains high, especially for oak trees. But the good news we have for you as we hit this weekend is that rainfall is going to help to wash away some more of that oak pollen. 8.30 in the morning tomorrow. Spotty showers near the coast. Nothing too heavy, so if you don't mind a few raindrops, you'll be okay. As we hit 1 o'clock, some hit and miss rain. As we head through the afternoon, nothing in the way of widespread coverage, but do expect a chance of showers. It's on Sunday. Sunday morning is when I see that rainfall returning and widespread from the North Bay down to the South Bay. Temperatures remain cool with 50s from Clear Lake all the way to the East Bay, down to San Jose 56, Santa Cruz 56, and San Francisco at 53. Coming up in about 25 minutes, we'll show you how to make your own rain gauge. If you missed this earlier, parents, kids, weather nerds, unite. I'll show you in 25 minutes how to make that Rain gauge. I need we'll to listen again. I need to listen again. <laughs> it, it is really cool. We'll see you soon. Jeff. All right. Thank you. Up next here at six o'clock, how does the two trillion dollar rescue package impact you? We've got a calculator, really easy to use on our website, that gives you the answer of how much money you might be getting from the feds.
Janelle Wang working from home and I ventured out briefly today and noticed people are still out and about some trying to get some essential items and I think some are just trying to get out of the house because they feel cooped up. I went to the local Target store and I noticed this sign at the checkout line asking customers to stand back until it's their turn and the cashier calls you up. I also saw employees wiping down shopping carts. This is Palomi. She was wiping them down with disinfectant wipes before handing a cart to customer uh, to a customer. I thought that was really nice. And the gas station in Brentwood, they had a sign at the pumps offering customers a pair of gloves to use before pumping gas to prevent the spread of the virus. And a sign in front of a hiking trail on the peninsula reminding people to keep their social distance. And if you're sick, don't come out and hike, just stay at home. But now apparently you don't have that option anymore in San Mateo County since they just announced in the past half hour that it's closing down its county parks because apparently too many people are going out there. So that starts uh, at 6 o'clock tonight. So just in the past half hour, those county parks are now closed. Now, if you do venture out, I want to show you some of the essential items I bring. I do bring disposable gloves. I actually have a whole box of them. So if I go mm -hmm. pump gas, I just use the gloves and I just toss them away. I always have an N95 mask just in case. And of course, I bring my homemade hand sanitizer that I made earlier this week because right when I get back into the car, I use this because I don't have a sink to wash my hands with soap and water, but I do that as soon as I get back home. You know, I carry my own little garbage can in my car too. That way, if I don't have a place to throw the gloves, I just throw them Ooh. right in my car, my own little closed, completely sealed garbage can. Very good tips, very good reminders for all of us. That's Thank you, idea. Janelle. We'll see you a little bit later, Claude. Up next at 6.30, invoking the Defense Production Act, what President Trump's order today means for General Motors and for coronavirus patients. Plus an unprecedented $2 trillion rescue package, but will it help the economy? We talk to a financial planner next. Right now at 6.30, President Trump invoking a rarely used Defense Production Act and ordering GM to manufacture a critical item that hospitals desperately need, ventilators. That move comes as health officials fear that infection rates are spiking. Here are the details. The president criticized, actually, General Motors for slow walking the production, saying GM was 
wasting time. Now, during his daily press briefing, he said companies, other companies, are ramping up production and will produce thousands of these much needed ventilators for hospitals. The next 100 days will receive over three times the number of ventilators made during a regular year in the United States. The president said the FDA will reduce or waive altogether the regulations in order to fast track the production of the ventilators. Okay, help is on the way to American families and businesses that are struggling economically because of the pandemic. The House did pass the $2.2 trillion stimulus package this morning. It's the largest in U.S. history. President Trump signed the bill just a few hours ago. It includes billions of dollars for hospitals and small businesses. Also funds $1,200 checks that the president has been talking about. We have our differences, uh, but we also know what is important to us. And America's families are... House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the Bay Area will get more than $1.5 billion, and that money will go toward helping struggling transient agencies, SFO, and San Francisco's homeless population. Now, the stimulus bill is going to put some cash in people's wallet, but it's really not going to be enough money for people who lost their jobs. They have to pay rent. They have to pay mortgage bills. So the bottom line is, what should we be doing with our money? For some answers, let's bring in David Barson. He's president of Barson Financial Planning. Thank you for being with us from San Mateo. Okay, we've seen the stock market go up and down so much. It went down, then it came back up, and people are just so panicked when they think about money. What's the first thing we need to do? Yeah, if you're panicked about money, uh, you want to check your overall uh, situation. Look at your, your stock allocation, your bond allocation, your cash allocation, uh, and, and you want to make sure that that's in line with what your overall goals are. And you don't want to make any rash decisions. You don't want to make any knee-jerk decisions that are going to uh, potentially take you off track of your long-term retirement goals. So, David, $1,200 really isn't going to be enough to get people by for very long. I mean, here in the Bay Area, things are so expensive. That may not even pay someone's mortgage at all. So is this the time that you should be trying to shift some money out of your retirement? Or should you just try to find some other options first? Yeah, Jessica, so that really depends on uh, the individual situation. If your back is against the wall, you don't have a lot of choices, there's really not much you can do. If you're, uh, otherwise, if you're a long-term investor or somebody that um, has more time uh, and, and investing for the long-term, whether you're, you're a young investor or somebody who's approaching retirement, uh, you, you don't want to make any decisions or rash decisions to stop contributing to your, to your 401k or taking money out uh, in a knee-jerk fashion, no. How long do we, what are you, what are you telling your, your clients in terms of how long they're going to have to endure this? We're hearing, that some, we're hearing from a lot of people saying it's going to be a deep but maybe a shorter recession, so just try to hang tight. Yeah, the way I think about this is, uh, you know, that, that retail store on the corner that maybe has shut down because they don't have any traffic anymore uh, and they've laid off employees. If those employees are, uh, you know, sitting there, but then all of a sudden the, the, a few weeks go by and the, and the retail store opens back up, then we're in a situation where that employee is going to go right back to work and we'll have business as usual. Um, if this lasts for three, four months and that business has to close down because they can't pay for the rents or can't pay the ongoing expenses, then we're in a completely different situation. Uh, the stimulus package, uh, I think, will uh, will not be enough in that latter type of scenario. Uh, so. You know, what I'm telling my clients right now is just to remain patient. Uh, the the portfolios that I've put together, the mix of stock, stocks, bonds, and cash for my clients uh, have taken these types of movements into account. And uh, and so I'm, you know, telling them that to, to hang in there, remain patient. All right, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. If you're someone that actually has one of those essential jobs, so you're in a good position right now, and you hear a lot of people saying, oh, this is the time to buy. You should be putting more money in the market. Or is this the time to buy a house if you, if you have the money? Is this the time to make a big uh, purchase like a car? Yeah, so I think if you, um, if you have a steady income coming in, uh, it, it, you know, if you have 12 months of cash set aside for living expenses, uh, don't postpone those expenses. I was talking with a client this week who was in that specific situation, looking to remodel their house, ask that specific question, should I be doing something different? And the answer was no. Um, keep, keep going about your, your uh, daily living, keep spending like you would be. And in fact, uh, there could be opportunities for some great bargains right now. Okay, what about, the, I think the big thing is, what about mental financial anxiety? You know, uh, how do you calm all those voices in your head uh, that are just screaming, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we're going to lose everything? 
Yeah, what I would tell folks in that situation is take a walk, go go get some exercise, get away from it somehow, um, at, at least for a short period of time. Like I said earlier, you don't want to make emotional decisions. You don't want to make any rash decisions. Uh, in fact, there's a study that's done by Dalbar, and it's done, uh, looks at 20-year returns uh, in the market of average investors. And what it shows is that the average investor gets about half the returns of the overall market. And the reason is, is because they get very short-term focused, they get very emotional in times like these, and they make the wrong decisions. So, um, yeah, you want to... Okay. You want to uh, be rational in that situation. Yep. Let's try to be rational. Thank you so much for helping yeah. us be rational, David. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much, Jessica. So when will we get the money and how much are you going to get? On our website, we've posted a stimulus calculator. It helps you determine your payout based on your 2018 or your 2019 tax return. If you haven't done your 2019, don't worry. You can do your 2018. Whichever your most recent filing is, you can find that calculator at NBCBayArea.com. Yeah, we just tried. It's a very useful tool and very easy to use regardless of your income level. You just plug it in and out comes the number of that check that you might be receiving. Well, a lot of closures to the parks and the other recreations. We've been reporting about this this coming weekend. A long list of what not to do. So what can we do? Here's NBC Bay Area's Joe Rosado Jr. who has some tips to keep you entertained. As scenic as any city may be, the same view can get old if you stare at it long enough. And with so much closed a weekend ahead, what can you do to keep yourself entertained? Well, if you need some air, you can still take walks, jog, ride a bike in your community, as long as you remember to give others plenty of space. But cities and forecasts of rain are encouraging people to stay in, so how to keep busy? There are many musicians like San Francisco's Meredith Axelrod doing live concerts on Facebook. Try this to stretch the muscle fiber. You can also try getting a little indoor exercise. Take the right arm up towards the sky. For something more calming, Marin County yoga instructor Mirabai Warkowiz is offering online concerts and yoga sessions. So when the mind is going crazy and you have cabin fever, yoga can help you, yeah, take care of your body and your mind. You think you're the first person? San Francisco's ACT will stream two of its recently canceled plays. It's a $15 fee on the ACT website and they send you the link the next day. We're seeing that a lot of people are hungry for the arts, uh, especially right now while they feel isolated in their home. You could also get some friends together and have a virtual party over, over Zoom. Zoom. But wherever you are in the Bay Area, here's hoping that if nothing else, you can at least enjoy the view. Joe Rosado Jr., NBC Bay Area News. We are blessed to live here. Uh, here's something good also. Schools across the South Bay are going through their inventory to see how they can help first responders. And you know what? There's a lot of items there. Take a look. This is video sent to us by teachers and staff at the Oak Grove School District in San Jose. With sanitizing wipes and hand sanitizers, the teachers went through their closed classrooms and came up with all that stuff, a treasure trove of cleaning items, a lot of supplies there. The volunteers then donated those supplies to Good Samaritan hospital in South San Jose. How about that? Very nice. Up next, a $25 million donation from Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla, how the money will be used to fight the coronavirus.
Another byproduct of all of this, a mental health tidal wave is on the way. That's the warning from dozens of Santa Clara County behavioral health experts. They say most of their patients are poor, homeless people who don't own a phone or computer to receive remote care. Providers are seeing big declines in revenue and are facing large layoffs at the same time that the need for these services is skyrocketing. The fear is more people will turn to substance abuse and other harmful behavior as a way to cope with all the coronavirus related stress. We liken this to a tsunami. The tide has gone out and things appear calm, but the wave that is coming from offshore will hit our communities and our behavioral health providers very hard. Leaders say it's not enough just to declare that the behavioral health services are essential workers. They need an influx of funding to deliver the vital and proper care. Mark Zuckerberg is using his fortune to help fight the virus. The Facebook CEO and his wife Priscilla Chan are donating $25 million, that money going to the Bill Gates Foundation, which is working to find a drug to treat the virus. The goal is to see if drugs already deemed as safe may be able to either prevent the virus or reduce some of those symptoms. Okay, this might be one of the highlights of our newscast. I think we're getting a science lesson from Jeff Frenieri on how to do some cool rain stuff this weekend. Take it away, Jeff. Yeah, a lot of folks uh, stuck inside with COVID-19, homeschooling the kids. We'll talk about how you can make a rain gauge at home. Right now, we still have some sun and, uh, well, a few clouds rolling in. But I'll talk more about when this blue sky fades and how much rain this weekend coming up in about five minutes. Your work is non-essential, but the boss orders you into the office anyway. I'm consumer investigator Chris Camaro. We have a recommendation for how you should respond. Next. Okay, hey, we've been hearing about this one a lot. You don't think your work qualifies as one of those essential jobs, but your boss is staying open anyway and tells you that you have to show up to work. So what are you supposed to do? Consumer investigator Chris Kimmer is here with a recommendation. Boy, we've been getting a lot of people calling and saying, hey, am I really, this is essential? Yeah, exactly. This is not hypothetical. Some South Bay workers that we know about just dealt with exactly this situation. We got a tip that a chain of non-essential retail stores was open for business. This week, employees ordered to work. Well, the public health department told us the business was not allowed to lawfully keep its doors open. Two days later, after our inquiry, that company closed all of its locations temporarily. The business said it initially had a different interpretation of the stay-at-home order. So what do you do in that situation as a worker? Attorney Kay Van Wey says speak up if you're told to come in.
I feel like there is wiggle room for the employer who wants to put his or her profits over their employee's safety. So if an employee finds themselves in that situation, they should read the law. It's written in plain English. And if they feel that their employer is blatantly violating the law, it is a crime and they should report it to the authorities. How do you do that? How do you report a violation? You can contact your local district attorney or you can pick up the phone. You can call 311, not 911, 311. We're taking virus related questions. Send yours at NBCBayArea.com. Click the main menu, then go to response or call us. The number is 888-996-TIPS. I'll be back at seven o'clock with news about virus related evictions. Today, a lot more people got protected. We're going to walk you through the process step by step, Raj. Okay, thank you, Chris. We'll see you at seven. Well, traffic around the Bay Area, you probably know this. Minimal feels like Thanksgiving morning all the time, but the CHP is still very busy. The CHP says because traffic is so light, people are speeding. They actually tweeted this photo of several tickets that they've issued, including one person going more than 100 miles per hour. Don't do that. Uh, here's the reminder and the slash warning. The CHP is out in full force. In fact, let's take a look at the traffic right now. A live look at the 280 17 interchange. Jessica, can you even recognize that? I, I don't think we've seen it so, so bare. This is usually packed during rush hour, but not tonight. But again, the CHP saying even without much traffic out there, don't speed because they are working in full force. It's like that no matter where you go. The roads are completely empty. It's like some futuristic movie or something. It's so strange. Yeah. Uh, our Jeff joins us now. And Jeff, uh, you're going to give us the lesson again. This is so exciting. It's like going back to school with you. Weather 101. You got it. Yeah, I know a lot of uh, parents are homeschooling and they're looking for some projects for their kids or maybe you're just a weather nerd and you want to track that rain at home. I'm going to give you some simple ways you can build your own rain gauge and track the storm this weekend. So let's first of all start off as we head through tomorrow morning. Uh, we've already noticed the cloud cover beginning to roll in, wind beginning to pick up. Our storm system is just offshore and that's going to bring the chance of a few spotty showers as we hit this weekend and temperatures in the 40s, not quite as cold as it has been lately, and that's just because the cloud cover is going to act like a blanket, uh, but still very chilly to start. 45 here for the East Bay, San Francisco 49, and the North Bay at 44. Let's give you a very close look at that hour by hour forecast on the rainfall tomorrow morning. Now, I don't see anything too widespread, but notice near the coastline, uh, Guerneville, also down to Novato, San Francisco, Redwood City, San Jose. We have the chance here of some spotty rain at 8 a.m. Nothing too heavy, so if you still want to get outside for a light jog or some fresh air, you don't mind a few raindrops, you'll be just fine. As we head through the afternoon, it's going to be some hit and miss rain. But the better time to test that rain gauge, we'll show you how to build, will be on Sunday morning right here at 9 o'clock as you'll see widespread rainfall from the North Bay down to the South Bay. So how do things play out on that extended forecast? You'll see uh, the chance of rain not only Saturday but Sunday about a quarter to a half inch on average for the entire weekend and will dry out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. For the inland valleys the big thing is we are going to go from a chilly 58 tomorrow okay so super cold jacket weather to much milder 70s as we hit next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and also on Thursday. So going to be really, really nice as we head into next week. But what about that rainfall and that gauge that I was going to show you how to make? Now, it is important to tell you uh, we're going to have to go through this, but you can go to Jeff Bernieri, NBC, my Facebook page, to get all of the individual screenshots of this. So here's what you need. A two-liter bottle. Uh, you need some masking tape and a ruler, okay? Those are all things we should have around our house or you might be able to find or ask your neighbors for to help you out. You wanna cut the top of that two liter bottle off first. Then you're going to take the masking tape and you're going to replicate what's on the ruler. You're gonna add on there five inches onto that masking tape. Now that's important because you'll then take the tape and you're going to add it to the side of the bottle. So that's gonna be how you're gonna measure that rainfall uh, right there. 
You're gonna line up that tape with one inch of water you'll put in the bottom of the bottle. That's gonna to help to keep that bottle grounded if we happen to get any kind of wind. And then all you do is wait for the rain and the masking tape on the side is gonna help you to add up how much we get. Now, I don't think we'll top over an inch on that homemade rain gauge, uh, but we'll definitely see about a quarter to possibly a half inch this weekend. So something fun for the kids and the parents and all those weather nerds this weekend to do at home. Uh, you know, I'm looking for projects at my house. I'm going to definitely assemble one. And look, you don't have to use a two liter bottle if you don't have one. You can even use a smaller bottle too. The idea is just to catch the rain some, some sort of way. Okay, Jessica, you think if I do that with Max that I'll get anything done or I'll be the one doing it this weekend? Actually, I think Max will be the one doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's, we'll, we'll put it to a I've test. I've seen your math skills. <laughs> I think, I think it's going to be Max. It. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. We're going to put it to a test this weekend. <laughs> Up next here at 6 o'clock, special delivery. A Peninsula teenager is helping with the elderly. She happens to also be a standout soccer player. We're going to show you how. Okay, if you've got one, you know that teenagers are a rare breed. <laughs> yep, I know, I know you deal with it at home. Here are a couple teenagers, Jessica, on the peninsula doing something good. Personal shoppers in a way. Nice. Here's NBC Bay Area's Anthony Flores. Kayleen Gowers is a rising soccer star. Her success at the Earthquakes Academy has led to her landing a spot on the U.S. under-18 women's national team. But these days... She's spending her time here. If there's anything we can do right now, it's help those that can't, can't necessarily help themselves right now. The Los Altos High School senior and her classmate, Greg Korn, go shopping for the elderly. A lot of them are probably scared and feel a little bit alone. Um, and so I guess that's where I got the idea for like grocery runs. Using social media, neighbors place their orders. The teens go shopping, then deliver for free. Any tips they receive, they donate to those in need. 
I really like it. Not only like are we helping people out, we get all these like nice notes from people. Uh, feels really great to help people out. It's more about that the human connection that you have with people. Um, just letting them know that we're here for them and our community cares for them and that they're not alone. And it's not just food. They're also collecting much needed supplies and taking them to nearby hospitals. There's so many ways to also get creative with, you know, finding ways to help people out. You know, it can just be as simple as telling your neighbor, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Do you need anything? Do you want me to get your groceries for you? Gowers is looking forward to playing at Princeton next fall, but today she is focusing on helping her community. It makes them realize that people actually care about them. Yeah. And so if we can, yeah, that, that makes it worthwhile, I think. Anthony Flores, NBC Bay Area. Very impressive. Okay, Chase Center may be closed for basketball games and concerts, but they're making sure that they do something good with all those leftover supplies and food by partnering with Food Runners. Food Runners is a company that collects food from restaurants, hotels, stadiums, and then they give them away to shelters and different nonprofits and rehab programs around San Francisco. So Chase donated big time giving them lots of food so that people can bay, go back and re-enter society. It's been, they, Chase has been doing it over and over again, big chunks of lots of food and did it today again. Yeah, Wonderful. it's nice to see our local arenas and stadiums doing that. Also, just a lot of companies with their extra mm -hmm. services, goods, uh, and supplies. That's going to do it here at 6 o'clock. We are not done, though. We're going to continue our newscast with a special edition of 7 p.m. news here at NBC Bay Area. <laughs>
Right now at seven, another grim milestone in the U.S. The number of COVID-19 cases surpassing 100,000. What changes are being made in the Bay Area as we head into this weekend? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our special 7 p.m. newscast. I'm Jessica Aguirre coming from the NBC Bay Area studios. And I'm Raj Mathai in the newsroom. We're also joined by Janelle Wang, who was working from home with some other parts of our coverage this evening. Janelle. Yeah, Raj and Jessica, it's been a busy day. I interviewed Dr. John Torres. He's the NBC News medical correspondent, and he told me about some new medicines in the works to treat the sickest patients of the coronavirus. I'm going to have that story in about 10 minutes, but for now, I'll send it to you. Back to you both. Okay, thanks, Janelle. Tonight, lots of developments to tell you about from the Bay Area and around the nation. Governor Newsom taking action today to protect renters. Following in the footsteps of several Bay Area cities, he put a statewide ban on landlords evicting renter. That order is in effect through May. Here in the Bay Area, there are now more than 1,600 cases. Now, late today, Marin County announced its first death. The patient was a man in his 70s. He was exposed to the virus on that cruise ship, the Grand Princess, last month. And in the last 10 minutes, Napa County announcing a ninth case. Santa Clara County continues to see the most cases at 500. And 74. Let's put things into perspective here. Here are the cases in the Bay Area compared to California. You see the California graph there on top in the yellow, the Bay Area in orange. As of yesterday, 3,000 cases statewide. Tonight, that number stands at 3,800 statewide. The Bay Area has about a third of those cases. Let's bring in our investigative reporter, Bagat Shaban, who joins us in San Francisco. Bagat, we hear a lot about the number of cases going up. What's the projection of when the cases will start to come down and decrease? Yeah, Raj, good question. Well, we do know from some new numbers that were just released this week that the death rate for the coronavirus is actually expected to drop down to zero in this country by July 16th. That's according to those new figures that were released. But by then, it's also estimated that COVID-19 will have, um, by that point, will have actually reduced the number. The new projections show that in California, the worst of the virus may still be nearly a month away. The data also reveals critical shortages inside hospitals across the state as a result of the surging number of infections. There are about 19,000 ICU hospital beds in the state. But when the virus peaks, we will likely need more than 2,000. In a worst case scenario, more than 5,000 ICU beds. And if the virus peaks next month, as the data suggests, the death toll would hit 148 people a day in this state. The worst case scenario puts the daily death toll at 371. By mid-July, the virus will have likely killed 6,100 people in California. But again, in the worst case scenario, that number could reach as high as 17,000. Okay, but again, those numbers are startling. How does the fact that we've been aggressive in a statewide shelter at home uh, order and that we've been so aggressive, how does that factor at all, if at all, into this? Yeah, interestingly, just the researchers who actually put this together say that is factored in. So not only did they actually include the fact that communities, obviously including ours and across the state of, of California, are actually sheltering at home, but these figures actually assume that people will continue to do that through the duration of this pandemic. Well, that seems even more disconcerting when you put it in that, that that's actually factored in. So how do we compare to the rest of the country when it comes to the severity of this and the likelihood that we could have this number of deaths? You know, interestingly, when you actually look at the data, we crunched the numbers today, Jess, and there are some positive signs that the steps that California took early on are actually paying off. Take New York, for example. New York actually is home to about half the population of California, but is still expected to see some 4,000 more deaths by mid-July. Um, another thing that we're seeing is that when you look at the, the country as a whole, um, they're actually, the, the U.S. is actually expected to reach its peak of coronavirus deaths in about mid-April. California, however, isn't expected to reach its peak until late April, probably about a week and a half later. So what does that mean exactly? Well, we've heard a lot about the importance of what they say is uh, bringing down the curve, flattening the curve. So we're seeing evidence of that here in California where we're actually being able to delay the peak of cases till a little bit later, which actually helps flatten the curve out. And fortunately, or um, rather the hope is that will actually end up helping protect people later down the line.
Uh, again, it's late April when we're expected to see it peak. And then hopefully by July, we're going to start to see those cases go down dramatically, Jess. Okay, this is a long game for sure. And uh, thank you so much for analyzing and crunching this. A lot to take in, a lot for us to wrap our heads around. We've laid out all the data and more on our website so you can go again, look at it again, and read it again. It's at NBCBayArea.com. And there's that curve we were referring to. Now, the Bay Area's most populated county, quite literally sounding the alarm, or reminding people to stay at home. You might have received this emergency alert similar to Amber Alerts, Santa Clara County health officials sending it out late this afternoon, emphasizing how important it is to shelter at home. 20 people in that county have now died from COVID-19. We believe the only tool that we have that is really working is, um, is social distancing. Now, health officials say the virus is probably more prevalent than we think and has likely been in Santa Clara County since about December. Well, San Mateo County just announced some major changes that impacts people from many other counties as well. All county parks, which include many beaches, are closed part of way to just keep crowds from gathering the way they did last weekend. In San Francisco, parking lots at several beaches and open space areas are now closed, even barricaded. That includes parking lots for the Marina Green, Ocean Beach, and Chrissy Field. Mayor says they don't want to get to the point where they actually have to close the park itself, just the parking lot for right now. But if they have to, they will. We uh, are uh, pushing folks to really try and stay, uh, get your fresh air, walk your dogs, uh, but don't get in your cars and drive to specific locations uh, to play volleyball with your friends, to have picnics, to have wine parties. So here's what they're saying. You want to get some fresh air? Great. Go outside, but maintain social distance. Don't play basketball. Don't sit in a picnic. Don't sit around and drink wine altogether. Yeah, maybe you can help. And here's a way from the corporate level to the ground level. We found another group of people helping to fight this crisis. This weekend, a group of UCSF medical students will be out taking donations of masks. They organized this drive last weekend, and in three days, they collected more than 14,000 of those N95 masks and some other masks in just one location in San Francisco. This weekend, they're bringing in more locations. Joining us now from the city, UCSF medical student Hunter Jackson. Hunter, thanks for your time. Tell me, how did this start? What came about to how you getting all this done here? Yeah, thanks for having me, Raj. So last week, uh, a couple of other medical students, Francis Wright and India Perez Urbano and I, were growing increasingly alarmed and frustrated with the situation happening both nationally and in our local hospitals with the shortage of PPE or personal protective equipment. You know, we thought it was ridiculous that health workers in the richest country on earth were facing a decision whether to protect themselves or to protect the patients they were caring for. So we knew people had masks left over from the wildfires and in their earthquake kits, and we decided to start up this little drive. Hunter, you call it a little drive. How many thousands of masks <laughs> have you gotten in just one weekend so far? Yeah, so the first weekend we were blown away. The amount of community support was staggering. We gathered close to 15,000 masks our first weekend, and over the course of this week, and especially today, we've we've uh, surpassed 20,000 overall. So it's been more successful than we have ever hoped it would be, and we're very grateful to the community for showing up as they did. And Hunter, out of curiosity, who's dropping by and delivering these masks? Are it just regular people, or is it schools or other organizations? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we've had mostly individuals coming by, but we've also had everyone from dentists to hairstylists to office managers that um, had these masks around for various reasons, either because they use them professionally or had them for, again, things like the wildfires. So it's been a wide range, but mostly individuals. Okay, let's talk about this weekend. Last weekend, you had one location. Let's talk about the four locations uh -huh. this weekend. Uh, just give us a quick description of, of where. And we're seeing a list here, our graphics here. One is in Lake Merritt. Tell me about the other ones. Yeah, and a great place to find all this is donatepe.org or UCSF's own COVID website. Um, but we're going to have sites up in uh, Marin, Lake Merritt, San Jose, and Berkeley. Okay, excellent. We're seeing the graphics here. We'll also go to that website. And uh, as we wrap this up here, Hunter Jackson, what are you studying, by the way, at UCSF, and when are you going to graduate or finish your course? Um, you know, I was interested in emergency medicine before this, but now more than ever, I'm interested in emergency medicine and hope to be able to contribute on the front lines as soon as I can. Hunter, we appreciate what you're doing for the community. Good luck this weekend. We'll check back with you uh, as this crisis develops. Well, Thank you very much.
the race for vaccine, as we've been telling you, is about 12 to 18 months away, but there are some other drugs being tested right now that may be able to help treat the critically ill. Our Janelle Wang has been working from home. She joins us now with information from our coronavirus crisis center that she's running out of her house. Yes, exactly, Jessica. Yeah, that vaccine still at least 12 to 18 months away, but there are some medicines in the works just three to four months away, which will help treat the sickest patients. I learned about them from Dr. John Torres. He's an ER doctor and the NBC News medical correspondent. There's some medicines that are out there that we're looking at right now. One of them is chloroquine, which is a malaria medicine, been around since the 1940s. They've used that in combination with an antibiotic that seems to help some people, but the big warning is not to take it on your own because that combination of those two drugs can cause heart arrhythmias, so they have to be very, very careful. On top of, on top of that, there's another medicine called remdesivir, which is an experimental medicine they use for Ebola, or at least tried to. They're using it here as well. And they're using a thing called convalescent serum, which is taking the blood from a patient who recovered from coronavirus, processing those antibodies and giving it to a patient who now is critically ill to help them fight off the disease. It's a very temporizing measure, only works for a few weeks, but it can get them past that severe part, get them recovering, and then hopefully bridge the gap until we get those medicines in three to four months. Yeah, as for the pandemic, Dr. Torres says he believes the country will get a handle on this whole situation around summertime. Kind of the same information Bagad Shaban was getting from his medical experts. And that's when things will start slowly opening back up again and getting back to normal. So that is the hope around summertime. Good okay. information. Thank you, Janelle. Well, up next, the pandemic has cost people jobs. What the governor did today to make sure it doesn't cost you your house too. And being stuck inside like all of us are shouldn't keep you from enjoying the little things in life like dancing. Meet the woman who wants to help people twinkle their troubles away. That's next. There are calls for change and transparency at that Hayward testing center that we've been talking about for the last several days. A lot of people are flooding that testing center there at a fire department. Samantha Bellick lives in San Francisco. She has asthma. She's also feeling some chest pains. So she drove from San Francisco to Hayward to get tested. It's a free site there. It's almost a drive through clinic there. But after waiting in line for more than three hours, she was turned away. The reason she didn't have a fever, but she met some other criteria. At least that's what she was told. Everyone behind you is here because they have real issues um, that you're holding them up now. And I said, I was just part of that line. I wouldn't be here for three and a half hours if I thought that I wasn't sick. Yeah, it's a lot of frustration for both sides here, the people waiting in line and the administrators there. She's now calling on health leaders at the testing site to have more transparency about what qualifies a person to get tested. We reached out to those people in charge there at the testing center in Hayward and have not yet received word back. Well, if you're worried about paying your rent in April next week, you don't have to worry about being evicted right away. The governor just suspending a lot of evictions statewide. Let's turn to consumer investigator Chris Moore to talk about that and those protections. And that goes through May, correct? Correct. Yeah. Originally, we had a state, uh, county by county or city mm -hmm. by city right. thing. Nope, this is now statewide. Today, Governor Newsom issued this executive order right here. I want to walk you through it, tell you what's inside. First, if your income dropped because of the virus and you can't pay your rent, your landlord cannot start the eviction process. The new protections cover rent payments from April 1st through May 31st. And here's what you need to do. You need to notify your landlord 
in writing that you will miss a payment. You got to send a letter and do it within seven days of when your rent is due. Now, this is not a free pass for everyone. You'll need to explain how the virus has created a financial hardship and provide some proof. What's that mean? Well, a furlough letter, a layoff notice, or pay stubs that show your hours have been cut back. Now, this is a very important part. This is not free rent. If you stop paying right now, you will be required to pay in full later on. And if you don't, you could face eviction after May 31st. The governor's order says you'll need to pay back your rent in a timely manner. It doesn't define that time frame. So contact your landlord, work out a payment schedule, pay a little bit right now if you can, but keep that communication going. If you're already in the middle of an eviction, today's order doesn't appear to apply to you. It only discusses people who weren't able to pay or won't be able to pay on April 1st or later because of the virus. Now, if you're in a different situation, you might want to talk with your county court clerk or an attorney for some help. Now, we're taking your virus questions. Submit yours on NBCBayArea.com. Go to the main menu, then click Responds, or give us a call, 888-996-TIPS. I'll be back in just a couple minutes to show you our new online calculator that will help you figure out how much you'll get from the new stimulus bill. And, Raj, you have more about that. Yep, and that is exactly what we're talking about. If you make a certain amount of money, how much will you get from the federal government? Chris, uh, we'll see in just a